Today, I wanna to share 10 things that I wish I knew about Lightroom when I first started using it. So let's get started. Hello friends, my name is Brendan from BeWillCreative.com where we love to talk about photography and photo editing. And in today's tutorial, I wanna share 10 things that I wish I knew sooner about editing in Lightroom. Now the things that we'll talk about today are more tips and tricks to help improve your workflow. So whether you're a complete beginner or you've been using it for a few years, these are all some different things that will help to streamline your workflow and make editing in Lightroom just a little bit easier. Now the very first tip I wish I knew sooner was about importing. So obviously you can import photos by clicking on the import option, but then you have to go and navigate through all of your hard drives and the individual folders to find your images that you wanna import. And if you're like me, I have folders inside of folders inside of folders, and it's kind of a pain to navigate through all of that right here. So after I've imported my photos, I already have that folder at quick access because it's probably already open in my finder or something like that. So let's just say that I've just freshly imported this folder right here. I already have it selected in my finder, so I could just click and drag this over into Lightroom, and then it will automatically locate that file on my computer, and then I can import all of those photos instantly. I don't have to go and navigate through anything. I can just drag and drop, and it makes life really easy, and then I click import, and the job is done. Now tip number two comes down to calling your photos and adding flags or ratings to all of your images. Now by default, when you are adding a flag to your photo, you just press P on your keyboard to flag it, and then you'd have to press the arrow key to move on to the next image. So you're basically going back and forth between adding a flag or a rating and then hitting the arrow key. Instead, to speed that whole process up, you can use something called auto advance by going to photo and down here to auto advance. And what that does is every time you add a rating to an image, it skips over to the next photo. So for example, if I press P to pick this photo, it jumps to the next photo. Press P again, jumps to the next photo. If I add a star rating, it jumps to the next photo. You get the idea. So the advantage here is you don't have to be pressing your arrow keys over and over again while you're calling through your photos and it just makes life a little bit easier. By the way, if you want to learn how to call photos in a workflow that I love to use in Lightroom, then make sure to check out my previous tutorial all about that via the link in the description below. Moving on to tip number three comes in the develop module and particularly in the crop and straighten adjustment option. Now in this photo, obviously the horizon is a little bit crooked, so we need to straighten that. And you might already know this, but the angle slider is the basically the default way of doing that. By changing the angle slider, you can adjust the angle of your image to straighten out any horizon lines. But what if there was a faster way to straighten your images just with one click? That's where the straighten tool comes into play. So setting our angle slider back to zero, I can then access the straighten tool just by clicking on this icon right here. And the way this works is I can click and drag on any edge in my photo and then let go and Lightroom will automatically align my photo to make that edge straight. So in this case, since I dragged along this horizon line right here, now that line is straight in my image and therefore my entire photo is now straight too. So that straighten tool is a really easy way to quickly straighten your photo, especially to a specific edge without having to mess around with the angle slider. Now for tip number four, we'll still be in the crop and straighten tool, but this time we're gonna talk about changing your photo from landscape to portrait. Now currently this photo is landscape, but if I wanna change it to portrait, all I have to do is press X on my keyboard and then it's gonna switch that around for me. What will happen though is whatever aspect ratio your photo is, whenever you switch the orientation, that aspect ratio will stay the same. So in this case, the aspect ratio of my vertical image is still the same as my horizontal image. However, if you wanna change that aspect ratio, say like a four by five crop for Instagram, you can just click on this option right here here, go to four x five for four x five Instagram crop, and then you just reposition it wherever you want. And then now you've turned a landscape photo into a portrait image cropped for Instagram. So you can do that with any of your Instagram photos and it's a nice way to save yourself a little bit of time rather than having to do it later on on your phone or something like that. Now for tip number five, this one has to do with white balance adjustments. And in this case, I just have a photo that's extremely warm and I wanna correct the white balance to look a little bit more natural. Now you can obviously adjust the temperature slider manually, but what if there was an easier way to go about this? With the eyedropper tool right here, you can click on that and then you can sample any color in your image to use as your sample white balance color. Now in this case, since his shirt is white, I'm gonna select that white 
on his shirt, click on that, and then now my white balance automatically gets corrected to match that specific sampled area. So this works extremely well to correct the white balance of any photo, and it works even better when you're shooting indoors and you're dealing with those orange lights all the time. So if you don't have a white shirt, you can use things like a white wall in the background, or even the whites of someone's eyes will make do as well. This isn't the best option for creative white balance adjustments, however, if you just want a clean and realistic white balance, then this is the best way to do it in my opinion. Going into tip number six, we're gonna talk all about the HSL adjustments, and at this point, even if you're completely new to Lightroom, I'm sure you understand the basics of what's going on here. Obviously, you have your hue, saturation, and luminance. You can adjust any of these color ranges by moving the sliders accordingly. Now, the problem here is that when you want to select a specific color, you don't always know which color range to target, so you end up playing around with a bunch of different sliders until you end up adjusting that one part of your photo that you were looking for. Because in some cases, reds and oranges can be similar, or greens and yellows can be similar too, so you don't always know exactly what color you need to adjust. Luckily, you can use a sampling option right here and then you can just sample any color in your photo and then adjust your hue, saturation, or luminance accordingly. So to give you an example, here within the hue option, I'll click on the sample and then I'll go anywhere in my image to pick a color. Now let's say I wanna change the color of these bushes. So I'll just click to sample that green and then if I drag up, it'll change the hue one way or if I drag down, it'll change the hue another way. If I wanted to change the saturation or luminance, I would just have to do the exact same thing except within one of those specific options. Since I'm in the hue option right now, that means that I'll only be adjusting the hue of the colors that I sample. But let's say if I go to this luminance option, I can once again click on the sample and then picking any color in my photo, I'll now adjust the luminance of it rather than the hue like we were before. So using this sample option just makes HSL adjustments so much faster in Lightroom, and then you're not wasting as much time going through all those individual sliders, going back and forth to seeing which one works best. You can just sample the exact color that you wanna deal with, and then you're done and on your way to the next adjustment. Going into tip number seven, you might have found that when you adjust a slider, it's hard to get the specific number that you're looking for. You might find that when you're adjusting a slider, it's hard to make really fine adjustments because if you just twitch a little bit, all of a sudden you're way off track and you miss the adjustment that you're going for. Maybe that was a little over exaggerated. Instead of manually dragging your slider adjustments, you can use the up or down arrow keys in your keyboard instead. So for example, clicking on this exposure slider, I can press down on the keyboard and it will adjust it in 0 0.10 stop increments. So this just makes it really easy to make targeted fine-tuned adjustments. So the exposure and contrast sliders will adjust by 10 versus the highlights, shadows, and all that stuff will only adjust by five points. If you want to do larger adjustments, you can hold the shift key while using the up or down arrow keys, and then that will increase it by increments of 20 rather than five. Now with that said, this brings us into tip number eight, and that is resetting any adjustments. So let's say that the highlights adjustment, I've gone way too overboard on this, and I wanna set it back to zero. Obviously, you can click and drag it back to zero, but then you have to really make sure that it ends up at zero and not some other number. To make life easy, all you have to do is double click on a slider and it will reset it back to zero. So any slider you work with, just double click on it, it resets it back to its default value. Even with our white balance adjustments, if I increase that to something different, I can just double click on that and then it will reset it back to its original state. So that double click option really helps to quickly reset any adjustment that you don't like rather than having to manually do it yourself. Going into tip number nine, this one allows you to use the adjustment brush and create a mask, but with a little bit more control. So by default, clicking here on the adjustment brush, you can change all of your brush settings right down here. So I'll just increase the size like so. Now we'll just go and paint over the rock. And what I want to do is just create a mask around the rock, but I don't want much to affect the background here. So if I press O on my keyboard, I can view that mask. But as you can see, it's affecting parts that aren't actually on the rock. Some of those bushes are affected, some of the background there is affected. So that means that when I go to make that adjustment, so let's say boost the exposure, for example, it also brightens those surrounding areas, which ends up 
giving a not so great look to your selective adjustments. So to fix this problem, you could go back and forth between adding and subtracting from your mask, but there's an even easier way of doing it called auto mask. So deleting that adjustment and starting again, we'll go down to our brush settings, but this time we'll check off auto mask. And what auto mask does is it samples the exposure and color values within the center of your brush and looks for similar parts of your photo to lock your mask onto. So for this case, since I'm painting over the rock here, I'll press O so I can view that mask. Since it knows that the color of the rock is that light gray, it's not going to go over and select any of the trees or things like that. So this time around, notice how the trees are left completely untouched and even going around the base of the cliff, none of those trees are selected. It does spill a little bit over into the gray areas because they match the same look and color as the rock, but for the most part, it does a really good job to refine that mask to a more specific area. So then when it comes time to actually making those selective adjustments, increasing that exposure, now I don't have that weird haloing around the rock and the background is left untouched. If you wanna learn more about auto mask and how it works along with two other amazing masking tools in Lightroom, then make sure to check out a previous tutorial where I talk all about that stuff down in the description below. Now for tip number 10, we'll talk all about sharpening and a way to refine your sharpening adjustments a little bit more using masking. So you've probably already used the detail panel and obviously you can increase the sharpness of your photo just by increasing the amount slider like so. Now the problem is by default, when you increase the sharpening in a photo, that sharpening is applied equally across everything in your image. The result is you end up getting an overly sharp photo that doesn't always look the best. So that's where masking comes into play. With the masking slider right here, you can increase this and it will refine what areas of your photo are actually being sharpened and which ones are not. By default, obviously this isn't very helpful because you can't see what the heck is going on. Personally, looking at this photo, I don't see any difference between this masking option and just setting it to zero. That's where holding the alt or option key comes into play. So clicking on the masking slider, holding alt or option on the keyboard, now notice how my photo becomes black and white. And if you're familiar with layer masks in Photoshop, this is a very similar idea. Everything that is white is going to be affected by the sharpening while everything that is black will not be affected. So as you increase the masking, it refines that sharpened area, AKA the white that you see to only affect certain parts and certain edges in your photo. So as you increase that masking, less and less will be sharpened, except it will be refined to specific edges in your photo. So holding alter option, clicking on that masking slider is a really helpful way to refine your sharpening adjustments without affecting your entire photo at once like you see here you can then refine it to only affect specific edges and then blend a higher sharpening adjustment into your photo without it looking too post-processed or overdone or things like that. So those were the 10 things that I wish I knew sooner in Lightroom and boy oh boy do they make a difference in my editing. If there's something that I didn't mention in today's video that you feel really changed the way you work in Lightroom, then make sure to let me know down in the comments below and I'd love to hear what types of things you like to do in Lightroom. Now if you learned something today, then make sure to hit that like button as it really does make a difference and also consider subscribing to stay up to date with more tutorials just like today. Anyways guys, it's all I have for you for now. My name's Brendan from BeWillCreative.com and I'll catch you back here next time for another new tutorial. See you then.